Um, so Angeline is our first CPA is a tax specialist with Accurate Accounting CPAs, LLC. Angeline received her bachelor's degree in mathematics and economics from Smith College and her master's degree in professional accounting from the University of Texas at Arlington. She is a licensed CPA in Texas and Maryland. She began her public accounting career with KPMG. Following the 2008 revamp of the Form 990, Angeline began to focus on the reporting requirements of tax-exempt organizations. She is a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Maryland Association of Certified Public Accountants, and she has lots of great information for us today, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Angela. All right. Thank you so much, Stephanie. As you can, I hope everyone can see on the slide, this is unrelated business income tax, and what I really want to focus on is upfront upfront thinking for museum stores. Um, as an accountant, I see a lot of after the fact. Uh, people come to me um, just before their due date and start presenting information, and I can see that the upfront thinking has been missing. And so my idea is that if we have a little bit of what we're doing on the front side clear and understood, it always makes reporting later in the end, and we're not kind of caught wondering what we're supposed to do. So first of all, I do just want to point out a couple things. Um, I do want everyone to understand that every situation is different. Each of you has a unique store, a unique museum, and a unique mission. So this information is hopefully accurate. I've certainly done my very best, but this is not going to substitute for your own personal CPA or attorney or professional. So if you have a specific fact situation, that's something you may want to check with a professional who can understand exactly what's going on. And um, this is training and reference. Um, again, this is not a substitute for personal professional guidance. All of these things are questions of facts and circumstances, and subtle changes in facts and circumstances can, can make big differences. So I really hope to increase your understanding today, but um, I'm not, unfortunately, your CPA, and we don't have a client relationship um, either with me or with Accurate Accounting Certified Public Accountants. Um, so I can't promise you that this information will relate exactly to your situation, so I don't offer any warranties on it. So this is just telling you to, to be cautious. We're trying to further your understanding, but you do need to be aware that this is legal, so there's always little, little questions there in interpreting the law. Um, and finally, the U.S. Treasury Circular 230, I'm required to inform you that this is not a covered opinion. It's not intended or written to be used to avoid penalties. Um, don't use this to avoid penalties and don't pass it on to anyone else, implying that they can and they should seek their own advice. So now that that's out of the way, let's talk about what we came here to talk about, which is unrelated business income tax. Just what it is, is it's an income tax on profits that are generated from an unrelated business activity that's operated by a tax-exempt organization. So this is an income tax. Um, lots of businesses pay income tax, and of course that's only on income, which is your net profits. Well, the only thing that's special is this is a tax paid by organizations that are ordinarily tax-exempt. So let's look at some of those terms. The first is a business. You know, How do I even know if I'm operating a trade or business? A trader business is selling products or services for the production of income. So a trader business is something entered into with the intent of producing income. There can be other intents of having operations. Also a business is something regularly carried on, the way a normal for-profit concern would operate. So if I have a garage sale right before I move, that's not a business. That's not regularly carried on. That's not the manner in which a normal business would operate. That's just me holding a garage sale. It, it doesn't count as a trader business. Also, this needs to be an unrelated business. Um, it doesn't substantially relate to carrying out the mission of the tax-exempt organization, and we'll talk about this in great detail. That's going to be the bulk of our, our coverage today, is what does substantially relate, what is unrelated. And finally, um, it's something that doesn't meet any of the statutory exceptions. So a trader business is, again, it's carried on with a profit motive. Um, that's something that um, can be confusing to people sometimes. Um, if you fail to make a profit in any one year, that doesn't mean you do not have a profit motive. And I always like to give an example of, of GM for those of us who are old enough to remember the Iacocca years, you know, GM went for several years without making a profit, but no one would have denied that it was a business. So if you have a profit motive, if you're hoping to make money, um, your failure to make money does not mean that you're not a business. 
Um, if you continually, consistently, year after year, do lose money and never make any actions to correct the way that you're doing business, that would indicate a lack of a profit motive. And that right there would not be a trader business because trader businesses try to make a profit. Um, also, of course, if you're losing money, you won't have income tax because of tax on income, which you won't have. So some of you may actually not be operating trader businesses if you think very carefully about this. But I'm hoping that you are all making profits, and I'm hoping that's what you're trying to do. So finally, the way the IRS sums this up is under what they call the commerciality doctrine. And that's just basically taking a step back. Would a for-profit entity be in this business? Would they want to? Would they be able to? Is this something that would continue? So basically, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. If it looks like a business, if you're turning a profit, or at least trying to and succeeding in most years, if it looks like a business, it's a business. Regularly carried on is something that's also confusing. Now, that can be consistently throughout the year, or it could also be consistently throughout a season. So keeping in mind, again, comparing ourselves to normal for-profit businesses, some of them only operate a small part of the year. Ski rentals, ice cream sales, um, many businesses in tourist areas. Um, simply because they have a season doesn't mean they're not regularly carried on. So if a museum store is operated at all times, the, business, the museum is open. Even if that museum has a limited annual season, maybe it's in a tourist area and it only operates during the tourist season, um, that would still be regularly carried on. If, uh, if the museum store operated in conjunction with the museum's hours, even though they were annual, that's still regularly carried on. And now this, the meat of it here does not substantially relate. So what does substantially relate mean? We're dealing with this kind of nebulous language. And then the IRS elaborates on it by saying it does not contribute importantly to the achievement of the organization's purpose. So they've traded another set of ambiguous language for us, substantially relate, contribute importantly. So how do we interpret if something does? What we're looking for is a causal relationship to achieving these purposes. So the result of the business activity is actually an achievement of the exempt purpose. If I have a museum whose goal is to educate someone about mid-century modern design, and I sell a book that elaborates about mid-century modern design, and people read that book, they would obviously be further educated about that. The result of selling that book actually achieves my exempt purpose. Now, someone can come to my museum and look at my mid-century modern furniture, or they can read the book they purchased in my gift shop. Either one of those is going to actually achieve my purpose. So we are really looking at a causal relationship between selling this item and achieving our exempt purpose. Some things that don't substantially relate. The first one is the one we wish did, but it doesn't. And that's simply using the funds from the activity to operate the organization. The IRS does not say that that contributes importantly to your mission. Now, obviously, it contributes importantly to opening your doors every day. But your mission would be, again, to educate, not to open your doors. Now, obviously, you can't educate if your doors are open, but that's not how the IRS calls it. So simply, we need the money does not mean that something substantially relates. The other one that we'd really like, but also the IRS has been pretty clear, souvenirs, commemorative items, any kind of mementos, their connection to the exact purpose is too slight. The IRS doesn't recognize it. So simply picking up an object that reminds me I visited your museum, some sort of souvenir memento, that's not directly connected to the purpose I was supposed to achieve by visiting your museum. So those do not substantially relate either. And a little bit of a subset of that is imprinting an item with the museum's name. That's not an important contribution to the museum's purpose. So right there, mugs, tote bags, anything like that that simply have the name of the museum on them, those are basically a souvenir or commemorative item. It's not an important contribution to the museum. It may be very good advertising, but advertising is not contributing importantly to the museum's mission. So these whole categories of items right there automatically for everyone do not contribute importantly to the mission of your museum. So what does contribute importantly to my mission? We've just kicked out a whole bunch of product lines. So we have to think about what my mission is. You have to look at your own personal museum and what your mission is. Because substantially related for one organization 
may not be substantially related for another organization. So it's your individual organization's purpose. Well, how do you know what your purpose is? I would hope that many of you have a mission statement. The IRS is very clear that a mission statement must be board approved and adopted. If you have a very lovely mission statement that was written by your board of directors or by a PR marketing firm or by an attorney who helped you file the Form 1023 but was not officially board approved and adopted, I would encourage you to get that in the next board meeting, have them read the mission statement, have everyone or a significant percentage, whatever is relevant for your organization, approve it and make it your official mission statement. The IRS really wants to see if they ask board minutes that support this is truly this organization's mission. Additionally, your mission should be on your Form 1023. That's the original application for recognition of exemption. Um, that is a permanent document and should be in your file somewhere. If it's not or your exemption was granted in the 19 teens and this is really something that's not available, um, I would encourage you again, go back, make sure you have something somewhere, get it board approved and adopted. The mission statement is something the IRS really looks at in many different ways and it's what you need to understand so that you can determine if someone said something substantially to your mission or not. The only way you can know is if you know what your mission is. So he's, here are some of the statutory exceptions. We talked about them. Um, there are quite a few. Some of them are very weird, like poll rentals of utility companies. I didn't bother to put those on the slide. If you want to see the complete list, they are in IRS Publication 598, and I'll give a link to that later. But I listed out the four that I thought would might be relevant for museum stores. The first one is a volunteer workforce. And if we go back to the commerciality doctrine and think about that, Normal businesses do not have volunteer workforces, so that right there kind of tells us we're not really a trade or business. So a volunteer workforce, and they're saying substantially all of the work is performed for the organization without compensation. That right there just basically kicks you out as not a normal trade or business, and therefore nothing is unrelated that you're doing because you've already missed that you're even in business at all. And this may be true for some of you. So substantially all, that's going to be, you know, the vast majority of workers are your volunteers, but you do have maybe a paid director who helps out sometimes or fills in when a volunteer is sick. It doesn't mean that you can never have a paid person filling in or helping out at the store. They really just substantially the work needs to be done by volunteers, and it's more of an occasional thing that one of your paid employees is helping out. Another statutory exception is convenience of the members, and then members has gone on to elaborate members, volunteers, officers, employees, at a hospital, patients, at an educational organization, students. So these are people who kind of have to be there. This is not the general public. And so the classic example of that would be a soda machine in a volunteer break room. Now maybe you're buying sodas very inexpensively at a discount store and selling them at a buck fifty and the volunteers are happy to pay that. And you're actually making money, but you're not really in that to make money. You're in that so that your volunteers can have a cold drink when they're taking a break. That meets that convenience of the members exception. Another one is selling donated merchandise. But this is not uh, where you have one or two donated items and most of it is sort of a regular store where you're purchasing from vendors. This is substantially all of your merchandise is received as contributions. Um, I actually did visit a museum recently where substantially all of their merchandise is received as contributions. That's how they operate. So that would actually meet that exception. But that's something where it, it really needs to be your basic core operation that you receive your merchandise as contributions. So if you're purchasing from vendors, as a general rule, you're not going to meet this exception. And finally, I think quite a few museums do this. Um, I know um, I received these from, I think, the American Heart Association, is distribution of low-cost articles. And the amount, the definition of low-cost is indexed for inflation, the most recent number that the IRS has published was $9.70 in 2011. Um, that's getting pretty old right now, but we know inflation has been really low. I'd probably stick with that $9.70 number. So this distribution would be something not requested by the recipient, accompanied by a donation solicitation, and something the recipient may keep regardless of donation. So that's, you know, the return address label, somebody mails me a keychain, says please donate to my organization. I don't have to return the keychain if I don't. I can use it or not, however I choose. But that's not 
an unrelated business because normal businesses don't do that. Again, they don't, they don't send you things for free hoping you'll give them money and accepting it if you don't. So all of these things, if we go back to that, what does a normal business do? So these are the main statutory exceptions that may apply to activities museum stores would be involved in. And again, there are some others I thought less applicable, but that publication, I do have a link to it at the end of the, at the final screen. So let's think about what unrelated business income tax is not, because this is where I think a lot of people get really confused. It's not a fine. It's not a penalty. It's not an extra tax that others don't pay. All for-profit businesses pay tax. So if you're operating a for-profit business, you pay tax. This is nothing special. This is not the IRS trying to stick it to museum stores. This is just treating museum stores like other businesses. And it's not an expense that could turn profits into losses. Um, it's levied on profits. So first of all, you have to have profits. Um, you've got gross receipts, minus cost of goods sold, minus other expenses. Now you have profit. And then it's a percentage of those profits. So you're never going to pay a tax and have your income suddenly turn into a loss. It's not possible for UBIT to cause you to be reaching into other pots to find the tax money to pay. So none of these things that people kind of fear are actually true. You're not in trouble. You're not paying a fine or penalty. You're not getting stuck with something that normal businesses don't stick with. And you're not going to have to pay taxes that are going to create losses. So really, UBIT's kind of not a problem. And I want to really beat that to death on paying tax is not bad. It's really not. It's just an income tax. Paying UBIT does not indicate any violations. You haven't violated any IRS law at all if you're paying UBIT. But in fact, not paying UBIT could indicate that you're violating IRS law. And there can be fairly substantial penalties here. Um, if I look at a museum store and they don't have one single bit of UBIT, I think, really? You don't have a single item in your store that you just sell for profit and actually do make money on it. I, I kind of feel sorry for you museum. I think you should be making profit. And I think that if tote bags with your name on it make a profit, I think you should be selling them if they make a good profit. So I kind of do want to see that you bit when I look at an organization's tax filing. So that, that tells me that they understand what they're doing. Um, the penalties can be 25% of the unpaid tax. There can also be interest for paying it late. And if they, the IRS can prove that the failure is due to fraud, that's willful disregard of the law. You knew better, but you did it anyway. And unfortunately, at the end of this, all of you will know better. Um, so I'm sorry to put you in that position. But the unpaid tax penalties can then be 75%. And again, interest on top of that. So we really want to look at it. And if we're not paying you but at all, we want to think about it. Is that really right? Because paying tax isn't bad. The biggest reason is income is good. If we're paying tax on our income, that says we have income. And after-tax income is still income. And we certainly all want to be profitable and use the profits from our museum store to support our museum. And again, these income taxes are a percentage of profits. They're not going to create a loss. They will slightly reduce the profit that's retained by the organization. But you hear it in the news all the time, you know, after-tax profits were, after-tax profits were. It's fine to have after-tax profits. That's just normal. Tax is just the way the U.S. operates. So let's look at what profits really are. We have our gross unrelated receipts. Now these are the items, and we'll talk about what those items are, that we sell to the public. This is our gross sales price to the public. Not 100% of our sales of our museum store, only those sales on the unrelated items. Less the cost of those unrelated items. That's something I really like to see broken out separately. That can be directly tra tracked, and that's the purchase price that the museum paid. Then we're going to further subtract out our operating costs, which could be employee wages, cost of displays, rent and utilities, all these normal operating costs. That's your profit. So already we're not going to pay tax on you know, expenses, only on that income portion. Then we have the UBIT. And if you're in the lowest UBIT tax bracket, which is 15%, you still have 85% of the profits retained by the museum in your pocket to use to further your services. There is nothing wrong with that. So those expenses that we can allocate, I really strongly feel that cost of goods sold should be tracked directly. If I purchase an item for 5 bucks and sell it for 10 bucks, then I have 
five bucks of the gross profit, and I start allocating my indirect expenses off of that. But I believe those things should be tacked directly because it may be true that your related items, you're actually able to mark up more. So you want to keep as much of that related profit in that related bin that's not taxed at all so that you can keep those separate. Also, you also you want to track these so you can see, are my unrelated items, do they have really small margins on them? Am I only able to sell my unrelated items at a very small markup? And really consider what kind of unrelated items we're carrying. So we really want to cost, cost of goods sold have tracked that goal directly for each item. Um, our indirect expenses then, you know, how do I know if a sales clerk is ringing up a direct or an indirect or related and unrelated? How do I know how many minutes they spent? What do I, you know, this is crazy. What I, you can't be asking me to do this. And I'm not, and the IRS isn't either. What we're looking at is a reasonable method. Um, a couple of reasonable methods are percentage of UBIT sales is percentage of UBIT expenses. So if 40% of my sales were unrelated, then I say 40% of my rent, 40% of my clerk wages, 40% of my utilities, and just divide it that way. Very, very simple. Maybe you have a very small amount of unrelated items. So percentage of floor space could be another reasonable method. We only devote 10% of our museum store to unrelated items. It's this very small nook where we sell you know, our logo wear and our tote bags and stuff. So maybe only 10% of those expenses go to the UBIT. Or maybe those are actually some of our most popular sellers and are a huge percent of our floor space. So we want to put that big percent of expenses to those unrelated items in order to bring that unrelated profit down and pay less tax on it. The key to these methods is consistency. What the IRS doesn't want to do is see you running the numbers every year and coming up with a different policy that produces a different lower profit every year. That looks shenanigan-y and kind of is. So come up with a policy, document the policy, bring your CPA or your financial group or whoever fills out your taxes in on this policy, let them know what works, and then just stick with it consistently until there's some very clear evidence that it's not working or does not accurately reflect the situation in your store. So when we're paying these taxes, we get to take normal cost of goods sold and a reasonable allocation of the other expenses of operating our store. And of course, there's, there's many, utilities, wages, all of those, also deducted from it. So again, profit is is an unfortunately small number at the bottom, but that's the number that we pay taxes on. So we're happy to see that number small. So hopefully I've convinced everyone that paying UBIT is not a bad thing. So why are we all still here? <laughs> what, are, what are we worried about if it's okay to pay UBIT? And this is where I really want to get into the upfront thinking for our buyers, for our museum store operators. You know, why? Why should I think about UBIT at all? If my accountant's going to have documented a policy, I've always tracked cost of goods sold, that's part of running a store, you know, what, why do I need to think about anything else? Let's think about it up front. High profit items that are subject to UBIT are still income generating. So we don't ever want to automatically reject a product line just because it's subject to UBIT. Again, paying tax isn't bad, so we need to look at that product line, think about whether or not it's subject to UBIT as part of the cost of carrying that line. But remember, if it's a high profit line, we want to go ahead and have that because it's generating profit for our museum. If we have very low profit items that are subject to UBIT, they may not actually be worth the bother of stocking. So it may make sense to reject some product lines that are subject to UBIT. It's a lot more record keeping. It's a lot more shelf space. Maybe those items aren't worth carrying. Maybe that's something that should be part of our upfront buying decisions when we're looking at any item. And then the biggest thing, and again, we'll really talk about this, is the gray area. Some things may or may not be related. Maybe I could tweak this item a little bit and make it be related. Maybe the item's almost related. So we want to think about, is it worthwhile to actually create a substantial relationship between the item and the museum's mission? And therefore, further the museum's purpose, which is always our first goal, is to meet our mission statement, further our purpose by selling these items, and as a bonus, we can avoid UBIT on it. So we want to look at those items up front when looking at those gray areas. So we want to think about after-tax profit. It helps us decide what's high profit, what's low profit, because tax is part of our expenses. 
They're just a normal thing. And we want to think about um, our UBIT tax bracket. Um, it depends on the bracket you're in, what may be high profit or what may be not worth the bother. Um, these are the normal tax bracket that for-profit corporations face. Um, you can see some of them are quite high in the middle, 39%. If you're in that, you're, you're, and remember, these are only your unrelated sales. This is not your whole entire store. So if you're going, oh my gosh, my store sells 100,000 every year, you know, maybe 50% of what you sell is related and you're actually down in that 15% tax bracket. Um, so this is only the unrelated items. But if you're up, you're selling 100,000 to 335,000 worth of unrelated items every year, you're paying 39% tax on those. You, maybe that shelf space would actually be better devoted to something that's related or you want to get some of those lower profit items out and devote shelf space to things um, that you don't pay tax on at all or that truly are high profit even after that 39% is subtracted. So this lets us kind of tailor some of our buying decisions. So you really want to look at this tax rate schedule and find out where you are. And again, I can't stress enough, this is only on your unrelated sales. So again, if you have 100,000 in sales, but 60,000 of them are related, you're in that bottom 15% tax bracket because your unrelated sales are still under $50,000. So let's talk about this substantially related. This is, this is the big question. How do I know if something in my shop is substantially related or contributes importantly? I've reviewed my mission statement. I know what I'm supposed to be doing, and now I'm sitting here looking at an item that um, a vendor is trying to sell me. This is looked at facts and circumstances. These are the very individual calls. You want to consider this generally product line by product line. You can get into item by item. I think it's much easier tracking to kind of go product line by product line. Um, the merchandise, remember, must cause the achievement of the organization's mission. That's how we're looking at something that's substantially related. So if our mission is educational, the merchandise item in and of itself is educational. Now, very easy, I'm, again, I'm a museum um, of aviation, and I sell books about aviation. There's no doubt that that's educational, and there's no doubt that that meets my mission. There's, those are the black and whites right there. But we also need to remember, and this is another gray area, that if our mission is to allow people to utilize our facilities, and that always is part of our mission, to be open to the public, then the merchandise contributes to the public's ability to remain at the facilities, that stands substantially related too. And the IRS has made varying rulings on these so-called convenience items, and it can be very gray. So it's something we really do want to consider. So we need to sell an item that contributes to our mission or that allows people to utilize our facilities. Most museums' missions include educating, promoting appreciation for, promoting interest in. These are phrases and words that we see in a lot of museums' mission statements. So I'm going to assume that something very similar to these concepts is in your mission statement. So if your mission is to educate, does owning the object actually provide further understanding? Is there something educational about owning the object itself, even if it's not you know, a book or something very obviously educational? Does simply owning that object promote education? If your mission is to promote appreciation for it, is this owning this object somehow further my enjoyment, further my appreciation? And if your mission is to encourage interest, does owning the object promote further pursuit of the subject somehow? Does that, does that spur me on to, to, to find out more? So we need to think about these things up front. When we're looking at education, interest, appreciation, the IRS is very clear that reproductions or adaptations are much more substantially related than interpretations. So again, with aviation, if an aviation museum is selling scale models of specific aircraft versus just toy airplanes. Now, my husband actually is an, avi an aviator, and I came home the other day with a toy airplane. I had not bought it at a museum store. I would bought it at a big box discounter, and uh, I thought it would be fun to have. And he took one look at it and said, well, that will never fly. The wings are too short for the fuselage. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, I didn't know that, but he did. So that's something that an aviation museum would have to consider. Does this really promote interest in aviation? Because I've just sold an object that actually can't fly, even though it's been represented as an airplane. So that's why scale models of a specific aircraft are much more substantially related to their mission than would just any toy airplane. 
Okay, an art museum selling postcards. If they've reproduced original artwork, they've paid attention to the color consistency, to the proportions. You know, they haven't just cropped it to fit postcard size. They've maintained things. That's going to be much more substantially related than just some pretty picture. You can't just say someone painted it, therefore it's art. You know, does it have something to do with your collection? Does it does it connect in some way with the original work? Is there something about it that that truly makes it a reproduction rather than just kind of an interpretation? Or a colonial life museum selling a working butter churn, you know, versus a tote bag decorated with a picture of a churn. You know, lots of people like that kind of country or colonial look to their home. These kind of things may sell really well, but do those actually tell me anything about colonial life if I look at a tote bag with a picture on a churn in it? But what if I took home an actual working butter churn and, you know, got my friends to come over on a Saturday and exhaust their arms and find out how difficult it actually was for our grandmothers to have butter. That's going to teach me something about colonial life, um, that your arms are tired. But this is the difference in reproductions and interpretations. So that's something you have to really think about. So in looking at that, we're really looking at the degree of connection between the item and the museum's collection. You know, how far away have we gotten? If I'm an art museum, but I'm a modern art museum, and this item is Renaissance art po postcard, and I don't have Renaissance art at all in my museum, and my mission is to promote appreciation for modern art, I'm getting pretty far away from my museum's mission with that. I'm going to have a hard time defending that a Renaissance postcard promotes my mission of understanding of modern art. The extent to which the item relates to the form and design of the original item. So again, this is that um, reproduction. So if I take a colonial button and put a little hook on it and turn it into a pair of earrings, but it really is pretty much a reproduction of a popular colonial era button. I've got a lot more argument there than if I just take a design motif from it, I change the shape, I make it elongated, more like a modern earring, really change it. That's going to be more of an interpretation. We're getting further away. The IRS actually looks at the overall impression conveyed by the article. And I know this is a very circular explanation, but you know, does it look like you're something you'd buy in a museum store? You know, my, my mom and I love to go to museums together. She can come into my house, pick up an object off my shelf and go, did you get this at a museum store? And she'll be right, you know? And I'm sure she can do the same things with, you know, did you get this at a big box discounter? So it's something that, you know, that something that gives you that this looks like a reproduction, this looks real, this seems high quality. Um, not that we can't sell inexpensive plastic toys and such. We just need to think about do they really convey anything connected with our mission? And again, to, to, to really hit on this, because this is something people kind of want to be true, and this is a gray area where I think there is a lot of fudging out there, is elements and design motifs may not be sufficient to establish a purpose of education to an otherwise utilitarian object. So if we take an ordinary household object, a tote bag, an umbrella, a mug, dinnerware, jewelry, clothing, any of these ordinary things that, that are otherwise utilitarian in our lives and simply decorate it with elements that are evocative of the museum, that's not usually considered substantially related. Um, if I have an art museum, simply printing the Mona Lisa on a t-shirt doesn't necessarily make that t-shirt substantially related. It's still a t-shirt. Likewise, if I have a botanical museum, um, stationery with floral elements is not necessarily substantially related. I think a lot of those, us really want those things to be, because those are things we can readily purchase and maybe sell at high profit. We don't have to have them made for us. But we need to really look at that and think, you know, does, does flower stationery really promote interest in botanicals, or is it just pretty stationery? So we want to look at that. So this convenience items exception, we'll look at this just one more time. Some convenience items contribute to the museum's purpose by allowing the visitors to stay there and enjoy the facility. So the IRS has actually ruled that if you're helping people remain at the museum and use the facilities, that contributes to your purpose. Because obviously, if they can't be there, you can't do anything, no matter what your mission is. Umbrellas and rain ponchos, disposable cameras, batteries, and film, not that very many people use those things anymore. Um, and dining facilities, including snack bars, have all been ruled to meet that exception of convenience items. If I have to leave to go to lunch, if I have to leave because it's raining, I can't meet your mission, whatever it may be. I need to be able to stay there. If these things allow me to stay at your museum, they meet this convenience exception. Now let's look at some things that don't. Cer 
certain items have been said that they won't. This is in Technical Advice Memorandum 955-0003. It's, it's very good. A lot of my information comes from that. And the IRS enumerated some things that don't meet the convenience exception. Local newspapers and magazines, aspirin, bottled prepackaged foods, tobacco products, these things don't meet the convenience exception. So now I'm a little confused. Look at this. I've got a convenience exception for battling rain, but not a headache. Now I'm just as likely to leave a museum if I don't feel good than if I'm getting wet, and yet this is what the IRS has said. I have a convenience exception for a sit-down lunch at a snack bar, but not a prepackaged bag of chips. So it's not for me to judge who's having a prepackaged bag of chips for lunch, but these two things have been ruled to be different somehow. There's a convenience exception for forgetting extra film, but not extra cigarettes. And I certainly know smokers will leave if they need to to get cigarettes, um, whereas a lot of people might stay even though they've run out of film and can't take more pictures. So these are some of those very odd, very gray areas that we just want to look at up front when we're thinking about purchasing items, not be faced with a decision after the fact when our accountant's trying to fill out our form and wondering you know, what kind of business we're in. So what are we doing now? We're faced with these gray areas. Now what am I supposed to do as a buyer? I'm trying to make a profit for my museum. I'm trying to educate, inform, create interest among the general public. I'm trying to have a beautiful store with nice displays. I'm trying to offer the public what they want. I'm trying to keep people in my museum. We have a lot on our plates as museum buyers. So now what am I supposed to do with all of these gray areas? Again, we want to get into some upfront thinking here, not be scrambling after the fact. So let's think about could something potentially be substantially related? You know, if something seems like it's almost close enough but not quite there, what do I do with that? I want to think about the record keeping required. Am I trying to save 15% worth of UBIT, but I'm paying expensive CPAs to come in and sort through things, or I'm having to use my executive director, who's a very highly paid employee, to come through and sort things? And again, how much risk am I personally willing to take? We need to look at, you know, what, what does that 15% or even 39% mean to me? When I'm doing the books at the end, you know, do I, do I want to feel like I'm fudging, or do I want to sleep well at night? So the most important thing, this is what we really see in museum stores, is this related potential. Some objects in and of themselves are not educational, but they could be if there was educational material with them. And this is where we see every time you go to a museum store, they have hang tags and package inserts and accompanying literature. You know, so a zoo sells a plush panda bear. Well, a plush panda bear isn't really in and of itself educational. I'm not going to learn anything by playing with my plush panda bear. But if my plush panda bear has a hang tag on his poor little ear that says he's a panda and gives me his scientific Latin name and tells me they live in China and that they eat bamboo and that they're an endangered species, now I've learned something. Now in and of itself, this plush panda bear has become an educational object. And it's really not relevant that the first thing I'm going to do is rip that hang tag off before I give it to my three-year-old because I know that's dangerous. Um, I have made that object be educational. And when we're thinking about these potentially related and trying to make them be related, the object is not to trick the IRS. We're not sitting around in a meeting going, how do we fool the IRS? What we want to do is promote our museum's primary purpose by providing an educational, interesting, furthering knowledge article. So let's really think about it from that, and then we'll let the absence of UBIT be a byproduct, be a bonus. So, you know, I've given similar lectures before and I had someone say, do you really think the IRS is that stupid? Are we going to trick them with this hang tag? And I'm like, we're not tricking them with the hang tag and we're not thinking about the IRS. We're thinking about our museum's purpose. We're thinking about items that we can sell in our store to promote our purpose. And once we've promoted that purpose, UBIT is not a question at all because if it meets our exempt purpose, it's not unrelated business. It's a related business. So we really want to get upfront with that thinking. So does an object truly promote the museum's exempt purpose when it's accompanied by explanatory material? So maybe it does. Maybe that's all this item needs. Um, I'm a museum of photography, and I've had famous photographs of objects um, very realistically reproduced into jewelry, but that truly reflects what's in the photograph. How do I, and I, if I could 
get that across to people, I could help them understand, maybe it's microscopic photography and I've got jewelry that reflects these microscopic objects that are actually really beautiful. If people understood that, that would be really educational and especially about what our abilities with photography are. So how can I make this beautiful jewelry of this microscopic object actually be educational? I just need the explanatory material about microscopic photography, about what these are, about how that photography is done. So the first thing to think about is, did the store have access to someone with the expertise to write the explanatory material? Now, I'm not encouraging people to go copy and paste something after, off of Wikipedia and hit print and you know, tag it onto something. Can we really put some educational material in this? Is this something that the museum experts, the museum educators have time to, to work with the store on? Um, can you really get together on these objects? And then again, the explanatory material, you also want to think about, can I include it cost effectively? Am I going to have to repackage everything? Um, making it available is actually not sufficient. It really must be included with the purchase item. It needs to be that if a person gets this item, they get the educational material. And something I've seen people do is have a whole entire rack of items, and then there's a little pamphlet beside it, and it says free take one. That's not included with the purchased item. It really needs to be attached, included in the packaging, printed on the packaging, um, somehow really part of the object so that you can be sure every person gets home with this material. So you do want to think somewhat about the cost effectiveness of including educational material and what that means. Now, of course, it does mean you're going to avoid UBIT entirely, somewhere between 15 and 39 percent, and usually this can just be printed material, which has become quite inexpensive. Um, but you do want to think about that up front, too. So I'm going to give a couple of examples, because these are, I think, things that come up again and again. Stationery and postcards. You can purchase these very cheaply and just put them in your museum store. But what's going to make them related to your museum? You know, we don't necessarily want to have to go out and have everything personally printed ourselves. We want to be able to buy things. So is this a photo of or depiction of an item that's in the museum's collection? Or something that would be in the museum's collection would meet your criteria? Is there information about the item on it? And preferably, this is going to be on the card itself. I should be able to flip this postcard over and learn something about the picture on the front. So that using the card, actually using the card by sending it, is going to promote education. If I mail this card to someone, your mission is going to be furthered for that person, even though they never miss visited your museum, because they're going to be able to observe the item that's in your collection or would be in your collection and learn something about it by reading the back of the card. Information about a painting or an artist is not sufficient if you're not an art museum. So if I have a beautiful painting of a tiger, but I'm a zoo, and the back of that doesn't tell me anything about tigers, it tells me about the painter, that's not relevant for my zoo. It would be relevant for an art museum, most specifically if they had the painting in the collection, but it would not be relevant for the museum. So again, we need to keep in mind that what's exempt for one organization is not necessarily exempt for another. We're always going back to our own mission. So with stationary postcards, things like that. Again, a botanical museum, simply flowered stationary, maybe not. Flowered stationary with some Latin names, um, geographic locations where the items are found, if that's right there on the stationary, I would say so. So we need to think about those things up front when we're purchasing something. Toys, jewelry, household decorative items, these are more things. You know, my aviation museum really wants to go out, buy inexpensive toy airplanes, sell them, make a high profit, and not worry about it. But if the first thing I can do is show it to an aviator who says, that would never fly, you know, we're not, we don't have an accurate item. We don't have a related item here. So all of these things, toys, jewelry, household decorative items, some of these high profit items, they may or may not be subject to UBIT. So let's think about them. Do they represent items in the museum's collection? Has care been taken to reproduce them? We've maintained original proportions. We've maintained original colors. And is the explanatory material included with each sale? So again, maybe jewelry. So I've taken a button and I've turned it into an earring. But the button is very accurately reproduced. And I've included explanatory material saying why that was a popular button style, where they were being manufactured. That's an educational item, even though pierced ears were not even allowed during colonial time. I've still made it enough connected to my collection that I think it is related. Nonfiction educational books. Remember, again, we want this to be about items in this museum's collection. So I know I've gone into an art museum, and they have a whole entire section of science books. Because people are there thinking about educational materials. They may buy an art book or two, and then they'll go ahead and buy a science book for that one kid who's just 
the scientist and not the artist. But again, that's not going to be related. Also, does it specifically relate to this museum? If this is a modern art museum with a modern art mission, they may carry books about Renaissance art, but those Renaissance art books are not related to their mission. If their mission is to promote interest in art, we're good. If their mission is to promote interest in modern art, something that about Renaissance art is not going to be connected unless that book really directly connects the influence of Renaissance art all the way into modern art. And then it's not a book about Renaissance art. It's a book about the history of art, including modern art. So we need to think about these things. Finally, with the gray areas, again, the record keeping. It's much easier to go product line by product line than item by item because we do need to track these items separately. Now, this is a two system. It's yes, no. Either it's related or it's unrelated. Things we don't have to track if it's partially related or if we made it related by including educational material. It either is or isn't. So you need a point of sale system that's yes, no. Now, this can be a button on a cash register. Everything is either A or B. Or if you're a very small store and you literally write things down in a three-ring binder, just write down an A or a B or create two columns to either check A or B, whichever one. It could be done very simply with the, um, having a, a one or a two on your price tag, having different color price tags. They're either green or yellow. And if anyone ever asks, you know, what's the difference? It's our inventory control system. It is your inventory control system. You're tracking whether your inventory is related or unrelated. You don't even necessarily have to train your employees on what these two systems mean. They just need to be very clear that it needs to be recorded as green or yellow, one or two, A or B. So all you've got to do is just one or the other. And most point of sale systems will, will handle separate tracking like that if you can just come up with this one or the other system. And again, I think product line by product line. Maybe you're a modern art museum. And you carry Hello Kitty. And you've decided that's really not related. It feels a little too gray for comfort. But it's really high profit, and the kids like it. And sometimes you do have Japanese art, and you've just decided to go with Hello Kitty because it makes big money. So we carry it, but we just go, you know, whether or not we have a Japanese modern art display or not or whatever, we're just going to say Hello Kitty is unrelated. We're going to go ahead and carry it because it's profitable. But it's easier to just say, if it's Hello Kitty, it's not related we're done, and move on, and not try to look at each individual object and go, well, maybe this one thing is related. And I see that sometimes, like clothing, very, very difficult to get clothing as a related. Again, this is an ordinarily useful household object. But, you know, we use t-shirts. So usually it has interpretations, or it has the name of our museum. It may have things printed on it. But maybe among these t-shirts, I have one that truly is educational. For some reason, it's got a a list of something that explains stuff on it. And it's funny, and the nerds like it. Um, and I say that proudly as a nerd myself. Um, but uh, it's just one t-shirt in this whole slew of t-shirts that really aren't related. Might be easier to just go t-shirts are unrelated and just move forward and not try to track this one t-shirt separately. You just track t-shirts in your store. Also, maybe you know some fiction books. Maybe I'm a history museum, and there are some incredibly accurate fiction works of history that are considered educational, and they win awards for it. But other than that, I have a lot of fiction that's really just kind of general fiction. It's maybe set in historical times, but not quite of the level of writing to truly be educational. If I just track fiction and nonfiction books, maybe I just want to say nonfiction is related, if it, of course, is. And fiction is unrelated and stop there and not worry about tracking this one book separately. The, the little bit of tax I'll pay on the sales of this one tiny item is maybe not worth the record keeping. So we can think about that up front too. And finally, risk aversion. How comfortable are you with gray areas? So um, what do you want to think about when you're thinking about these things? Um, how would you feel if you had to explain it to the next buyer, if you were training someone to take over your job as the museum store director or the buyer? Would you feel comfortable? Would you feel comfortable explaining it to an IRS agent or your board of directors? You know, if someone said, well, how is this related to our purpose on the board of directors? Would you feel comfortable giving that answer? How about the front page of the newspaper? So you want to think about, if I'm not comfortable with it, maybe we just need to go ahead and pay the 15 to 39 percent tax. You know, we've covered that there are a lot of gray areas. There's ways around those gray areas. There are ways to make gray areas, black and white. But ultimately, you need to sleep at night, and you need to remember that Paying tax is OK. That means you have profits, and it means you're conforming with the law. So maybe sometimes we just want to go ahead. If it's something that we're just not comfortable with, 
go ahead and call it unrelated. Maybe err on the side of caution if that's the kind of person you are. I'm not encouraging anyone to pay tax they don't owe. I don't believe in that. But you need to think about what you're comfortable with and what your board of directors is comfortable with. So finally, Paying UBIT indicates that the store is realistic in its categorization and that it's making a profit for the museum. All of these things are good. We're good with that. UBIT is not a fine, not a penalty, not a failure. It's a success. You've turned a profit on items that feed money back into the museum, and you're conforming with the law and you understand it. You're doing your job right. So paying UBIT, ultimately, it's a good thing. UBIT should, however, be part of your profit analysis when you're making any individual buying decision. Am I in a 15% tax bracket? Am I in a 39% tax bracket? Is this item going to be profitable after I pay that tax? Is it going to be profitable enough to devote the record keeping, the floor space, the inventory tracking? You know, maybe it's just not profitable enough. Maybe I should leave the aspirin sales to the drugstore on the corner and, you know, just stick to things that really do further my purpose. And think about Adopting a policy, making sure everyone's aware of what your mission statement is. If you have more than one buyer, if you have people out soliciting um, vendors, um, think about these things up front. And think about when you're looking at something, do I want to create explanatory material? Do I have museum experts available? Where am I going to go with this when I put it in the store? So publication 598, which is the tax on unrelated business income, is very general. It's written for real people, not accountants. Um, it's not written for lawyers or the IRS. This is written for taxpayers. Um, there's a link to it. You can find it very easily on the IRS website. Um, and uh, it's, it's a 22-page bulletin. Many of it, most of it is, is not relevant. A lot of it is not, but they're really good with subheadings. So if you see utility company pull rentals, you can just skip that page and move forward. So don't don't be intimidated by the length of the document, you'll be very quickly and easily able to go through, find what's relevant for you, and read what you want to read. I have searched very hard for this technical advice memorandum, 9550003. I cannot find it free and publicly available on the internet, but it is available usually through law libraries. So if you have any connection with a university or a, a law school, or if your law school is just open to the public, um, and you can go in and take a look at this. Um, again, this was a historical reenactment type museum. But it really lets you in on the IRS's thinking over what they saw as connected and unconnected. If you really want to get geeky with your understanding, I would really highly recommend that technical advice memorandum, although I think we have covered a lot of the thinking behind it. And I have tried to leave a significant amount of time for questions, and I hope that I have. Um, and you can also contact me later if you have a question you'd like for me to address personally and you don't care to discuss today or you are eager to go to lunch and are happy that this is over, then <laughs> you can contact me later. You can write to me um, in Maryland or you can telephone me at my office or email me, whatever you're happy with, but I would be very happy to take questions. And we do have some, um, although what, I want, what I've learned out of this is that I want to have a butter churn party now. So. <laughs> Working better turn <laughs> that's, that's, that's how you get those Jennifer Aniston arms, actually. <laughs> so. Um, so, so some questions. Um, Susan asked this actually really early on when you were kind of talking about logo T-shirts and mugs and things. Um, and she asked, "What about the walking billboard stance that that you're promoting your museum as a walking? You know, you're using those products as a walking billboard." It's, again, that's advertising, and I think advertising is important because no one's going to go to a museum that they don't know about. But the fact that you can sell these t-shirts and thereby, thereby you know, defray the cost of your advertising, that's really good. But, they, but if you look at your mission statement, your mission statement you know, probably doesn't say anything about knowing about my museum. You know, your mission statement is going to say educating the public about the beauty of architecture in the urban environment or helping the public to have further appreciation for the interest of aviation. Whatever your museum covers, just knowing that your museum exists doesn't actually promote that. And it's, it's a frustrating area because we want it to, because we all want to think in our heads, if people don't know about my museum, they're not going to come. Advertising is important. But unfortunately, the IRS comes back with, this is advertising. 
it's advertising you've actually been able to get someone to pay you to do, which is fantastic, but it doesn't substantially relate to a mission. The IRS has just come back with the, the connection is too slight, it's too tangential, and they're really very, very hard time getting logo wear, and I count tote bags, t-shirts, mugs, all of those things, very hard time getting those classified as related. Okay. Um, Howard asks, what about jewelry made by local artisans? Our visitors and community think this is an important role for our stores. We are owned by the city. Okay. Um, so what is the mission of that store? Is the mission to promote local artists? Is the mission, what's the museum's mission? Let's come back to that question. And, and the questioner doesn't need to follow up necessarily. I'm trying to guide some questions. So if they're, if they're interested in promoting art, if their permission in promoting local industry, if their mission is to promote um, independent businesses, there's all kinds of missions that, that the sale of items by local artists could promote. So go back and read your mission and think about does that mission really connect. And if people think it's really important and it's, it's, not, it's not clearly been stated in your mission before, but it's something you're really doing. It's where your board of directors is going as an art museum. It's really important to you to promote local artists. Maybe even look at your mission statement. Maybe the board needs to approve and adopt a better mission statement. Now, I'm not saying to have your museum store um, define your mission statement, but if this is something that your local public and your board of directors truly believes is important, maybe this does need to be part of your mission. And once it is part of your mission, then that will be connected. But I bet if you look at your mission statement, and if it is to promote artists or local artists or just artwork in general, you're probably good there. But go back and read that mission statement. OK. Um, another question. Can item categories brought in for an exhibition, so maybe a, a temporary ex exhibit, and carried forward after the ex exhibition closes be exempt? I, I think in many cases, yes. Um, certainly, um, you know, you have, you're an art museum and you have um, Japanese art and as part of that you want to promote Japanese culture and so you bring in origami paper and you put it in your toy section. Um, I don't see any reason why that can't be art and can't be Japanese art and can be connected, specific, especially if you continue to carry um, some books about Japanese art and uh, certainly the um, museum catalogs that go with special exhibits. Um, you know, I put a lot about, is this an item that's in your in your collection, um, and then a couple of times I tried to mention, or, or would it be? Because of course there are items that are in other museums' collections, and as much as we'd like to have them, we don't. <laughs> but we're very happy to toast traveling exhibits. So I think that yes, in many cases, um, those items that were seen as having part of your mission, you know, you brought the exhibit in because you felt it met your mission. And those items met your mission when you had that exhibit there. So continuing to carry those items forward, I, I don't see a lot of problem. Again, we want to go back to how, how gray is it becoming once that item leaves. Um, and I would think hopefully not too gray because you brought the exhibit in because you felt it met your mission. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit about cafe versus bag of chips in the store. Um, I think this is sort of related regarding snack bars versus prepackaged items. Uh, we purchase prepackaged sandwiches from a caterer and resell. Would that be unrelated or related? Um, are they able to sit and eat them? Do you have dining facilities? Is this lunch? So it's it's this is one of the grayest areas to me, and I actually I, I find that the IRS to be a little bipolar on this answer. Um, it's you know so they they really don't want you to be operating the local Seven Eleven, and yet they're sort of okay with you operating the local subway. And I, there can be a surprising amount of connection between these two styles of business. I think one of the main things that comes down to being the difference is if there is dining facilities. Um, so if you're selling prepackaged sandwiches and you do have a few picnic tables or you do have a lobby with some chairs and people are able to actually sit and eat lunch, I think you could make an argument that those are dining facilities and related. Um, if there's really no place to sit and eat, but you're selling the sandwiches and people are somehow just taking them away, um, now you're more, more like literally the local 7-Eleven. That's not related. And again, this is one of the very confusing areas with the IRS, but really the exemption has usually been dining facilities. So even though you're selling prepackaged sandwiches, 
is there a place where people can sit down and eat them, they can have lunch, and they don't have to leave to then consume their goods. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer asked a question. Our mission statement has been adopted by our board with minutes and is to educate it is education and entertain, to educate and entertain. Does that mean if we sell things in the store that are fun, that they are related? <laughs> if they're, if they're, I want to know, is it just to educate and entertain? That's it? I love it, because that's great. Um, yeah, well, I got a dot, dot, dot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. I think so. And, and, and again, we, we don't want our museum store driving our museum's mission. But if your museum does have a very broad mission that includes entertainment, then yes. And there's no reason that something can't be fun. I mean, I can go to the, to the, to the local, um, you know, science museum and, um, you know, buy myself a baking soda volcano. And believe me, I have fun making that kind of mess in my house. And that's certainly related. There's a very easy argument there that that's science. It might be chemistry. It might be geology. I don't know what it is. But it's fun and it's related. So if that entertain is part of your mission and these things are entertaining and they're connected, again, somehow to what your collection is, I'm thinking your mission is probably slightly more specific. But yeah, just because it's fun doesn't mean it's not related. Um, when you say item in the collection, does it have to be displayed for the public or can it just be in our holdings? Oh, I think either one is fine. I, I wouldn't have any problem. I know that many museums have very large collections and items come in and out of storage all of the time. So I wouldn't have, I don't think there's any question there. I feel very comfortable with that. Okay. Um, if you have something that's currently in storage, especially, and especially that's going to promote, you know, Many museums have large collections and things can't always be on display. So if you have a scale model or you have a postcard or a poster or something representing something, now you really are able to further your message because you can't always have every item on display, but you can have things in your museum store that represent those items, and that does keep them before the public. So I, I would make a strong argument for that, definitely further promoting the mission. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, maybe one t-shirt is related but the rest aren't or, or vice versa. Um, and the question is, audits seem to be item by item. Can you please explain product line? Um, I guess my take is that it's just a little easier for our tracking and our buying decisions to go kind of product by line by product line. And my, my argument with there would be just go ahead and say it's UBIT. Because you're never going to get in trouble for paying tax you shouldn't have, except maybe with the board. <laughs> and I'm not encouraging people to pay tons and tons of tax they shouldn't have. But if you have 15 t-shirts and only one of them is educational, to my mind, maybe you just want to say t-shirts are unrelated and stop there. Um, I would never say well, I have 15 t-shirts, one is related, and so I'm going to say t-shirts are related. Because that's where an item by item audit is definitely going to get you in trouble. Um, and again, if, it's, if you're in a 39% tax bracket and that's your best-selling t-shirt is that educational one and, it's, and you have a very good point of sale system that's going to easily separate out that individual t-shirt, by all means, don't pay tax on it that you don't have to pay. Go ahead and do item by item if it works for you. But sometimes for smaller museums, maybe it's not your best-selling t-shirt, it's not a high profit item, you don't have a sophisticated point of sale system. If it's just easier for you to say, we're just going to go ahead and pay tax on this one item to save ourselves a lot of headache, that's an option. But I would definitely not encourage anyone to pay tax they don't have to pay. So if item by item works, works better in your situation and you find that easy tracking, then by all, by all means, go ahead. Okay. Um, Leslie is from the Tennis Hall of Fame, and she's asking, would, all, would, I know, would all of our tennis attire be related? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Again, clothing is a difficult one, but now you've got tennis attire. That's something where I'd probably want to look at the specific wording of the message, uh, of the mission there. And if it's to promote participation in tennis, I don't know. I guess the clothing may make that possible. I think that's something I would, I would want to chew over with my buyers and my board. Again, I said usually clothing, you know, it, it's t-shirts and maybe, it ha you know, I'm a paleontology museum and there's a t-shirt with a dinosaur on it and they're going to be like, no, it's not. But a tennis museum with tennis clothing, that sounds a lot more related. I'd say go back to your mission statement and, and, and take, a, take a good thought on that. You may have a strong argument. Okay. Um, all right, Christy, I'm going to try to articulate this as best as I can. She, uh, she says, for example, we have the largest Wedgwood collection outside of England and are well known for it. Can I not charge tax on the Wedgwood I sell? I think she's ask, trying to ask if, if it would be related or not. 
Um, not charging tax. I'm wondering if this is maybe a sales tax question, mm -hmm. that we've gotten a little bit of confusion between yeah. sales tax and unrelated business income tax. So sales tax laws are state by state and sometimes municipality or county based as well. So I will not speak to any sales tax laws because there are hundreds throughout our country. Um, and I do know that some locations do have sales tax exemptions for museums, but that's not my area of expertise and of course is a very local issue, unfortunately. Um, as far as related, um, with for IRS business income tax for um, something that's filed with your 990 and your 990T, which is the annual filing for the business income tax, the Wedgwood would absolutely be related, very much so if you're a museum and you're known for that. Um, I think that she may be asking a sales tax. All right, she, she's, she's jumping in and she's saying she meant she had somebody, she got distracted and she meant pay. Does she mean to pay? Uh, do I not need to pay? I would say that those items are, if, you're, if your mission is to promote interest in and appreciation for Wedgwood and you sell Wedgwood, I think that that's extremely related and those should be in your category of product lines that are related to your purpose. Okay, great. Um, when using art, an art museum as an example, you mentioned, does this item reflect our collection? So are we to be focusing on, does it mean our collect, reflect our collection or on fulfilling your, our mission statement? Um, really both, and I know that's not the answer anyone wanted. Um, <laughs> first it needs to fulfill your mission statement and then it needs to be rather closely related to your collection. So again, you know, if your mission statement is to promote interest in art, then that's a very broad mission statement and that's going to cover many cultures and many time periods and many styles and now things seem wide open and broad, but you can't just go, we've got it, everything's art, I'm done. You need to look at it and see if it's really connected to your museum in some way, shape or form. So again, if, you're, if your museum has any kind of focus or any kind of limit at all, then you really kind of want to consider that at least secondarily if you're getting a little bit far away from what you personally do. Because mm -hmm. that's the next step that the IRS comes in and looks at, is how closely related is it. And that's where the IRS starts picking apart item by item and going, is it a reproduction or is it an interpretation? Is it related to your museum? So that really is a level that they look at. So it's easier if your mission is, you know, like I said, to promote interest in modern art. Well, now anything that's Renaissance art is not going to work. We know it's simple. But if your museum's mission is to promote interest in art, and art is an extremely broad category, now we want to start looking, how closely is it truly related to my museum? That really is a second level that we do want to consider. Okay. Um, Jennifer is asking, do we run any risks if we haven't category, categorized anything as unrelated in the past and then suddenly start having some? Is there a look back we sh should be concerned about? Um, the IRS can come in and, and audit up to three years back if they want to. Um, one thing that I like to do, even as a personal practitioner, and, and this is not, this, this, is, this is truly the way of a very complicated tax code is, my understanding has increased. <laughs> you know, based on better knowledge and better information, I've begun to comply with the law. Now, the actual rule for auditing individuals is that if you made an unintentional error of ignorance, you're not required to inform the IRS. So if you truly just made a mistake on your taxes in the past and you figure it out later, you can just let it go. Fraud is not the same. Fraud is different, but unintentional, legitimate just errors of ignorance, you know better now, the IRS basically gives you a go forward. Now if they come back and audit you for those three years that are open to audit, they certainly can reclassify some items as unrelated and, and ask you to pay tax on that. Um, often I think they would just ask you to pay tax, they would probably waive penalties and interest if this was honest mistakes, but my advice is always if you understand the law better now, conform with the law to your current understanding. And I am disinclined to think that beginning to comply with the law would necessarily trigger an audit. So I would encourage you to comply with the law now, um, and uh, if the IRS does contact you about those previous years, be as helpful as possible in looking back and seeing what you need to do about the past, but there's nothing that would require you to 
to go back and refile everything if those were legitimate mistakes because of lack of understanding in the past if you were not actively committing fraud. Okay. Um, if part of your mission involves food preservation, interesting, does that mean that virtually any item used in the kitchen would qualify as related? I don't like that virtually any item. <laughs> you know, that, that's starting to get a little broad. We're going food preservation, any item related to cooking, because a lot of cooking is not really about food preservation. So certainly any kind of canning supplies, um, things like that. But um, And then, you know, you can certainly are, well, I can't can something if I can't stir it, so I have to have a spoon. But again, I would, I would look at, um, are these items really related to food preservation? And, and just, you know, think about, again, how comfortable am I with gray areas? And how comfortable am I with broad brush strokes? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very curious about that museum now. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> but I would say many, many items are going to qualify. But really do think about how far away you're getting from it. If we're talking about, you know, a cupcake decorating set, that's an item from a kitchen. But I don't think that has much to do with food preservation. Mm -hmm. So I would be a little cautious there. Okay. Um, lots of very specific things. Um, if a museum has a photography collection and a photograph from the collection is printed on a mug with specific educational information printed on the mug, would this still be utilitarian? It's still a utilitarian item, but now you've met that, that's that hang tag educational material enclosure thing. It's not, it's not just, it's not we're a photography museum, and there a smug happens to have a photograph on it. That's what they're calling not related. We're a photography museum. This mug has a photograph from our collection on it. On the back of the mug, it tells you when the photograph was taken, what kind of, you know, if it was sepia tone or modern Kodachrome or whatever. You certainly know more than I do. Who the artist was, those things, that's truly an educational object. That definitely promotes photography, and that's related. And that's kind of that gray area we get to. You know, just it's a photograph that makes it related. Not really. It's a photograph from our collection. Here's educational information about it. Yep, that's completely related. Now, whether you put that on a postcard or a mug or a t-shirt or, you know, a fine art print, you know, high quality print of the photo, that's not relevant. Just because the item is utilitarian doesn't mean it's not related. What makes it related is the fact that it's from your collection and it contains educational material that actually promotes understanding of photography or the photographer or the photograph itself. Okay. Um, similar question, Natural History Museum, if a t-shirt has snakes on it and we put a hang tag talking about snakes, is the t-shirt now exempt from UBIT? I think you can make a pretty strong case there. Again, clothing is always kind of a little tough one. The IRS can just be a little sticklers about that. Um, what would make me a little bit more comfortable is if the t-shirt had the information about the snakes on the t-shirt itself. So we had the snake and then we had, you know, under the snake its Latin name and where it is and whether or not it's poisonous and those kinds of things. And all of that's truly printed on the t-shirt. That would be much more like the mug example we just talked about. The hang tag goes a little bit further, um, but it, it, that's one of those gray areas. And you have to decide what you're comfortable with. And of course, it would come back to, you know, are these, are these real snakes, or is this just, you know, a green squiggly line? And anyone would look at it and go, yeah, I know that's a snake, but are these, you know, are they accurate pictures of real snakes? Things like that start to become relevant. Okay. Um. We talk about the appreciation and enjoyment of aesthetic traditions of the American West and Native Americans in our mission statement. If jewelry is made by Native Americans and it has elements of their traditional style, is that related? Can you read the first part of the mission statement again for me? Uh, appreciation and enjoyment of aesthetic traditions of the American West and Native Americans. I would think so. I would think if this is, even though this is contemporary jewelry, um, if it contains elements of the aesthetic tradition, which is right there in your um, mission statement, and it's actually produced by um, contemporary people of Native American descent, I think that that's related to your mission. And I know that sometimes I've just, I just got back from the American West myself. That's where I've been on vacation. And I know some things are, are very modern interpretations, but they use traditional methods or they use some traditional designs. I think that your mission statement is written such that that does sound related to me because you are talking about the ongoing aesthetics. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we have cows and pigs as part of our living collection, and our mission is related to educating and entertaining the public on rural life and culture. Would plush cows and pigs and similar kids' toys be close enough to be related? They are certainly fun and related to things visitors see and hear about when they visit. And those are the kind of things, plush animals are kind of the classic example of where you want to see a hang tag. Um, again, so it's like my panda bear example with the zoo. A panda bear toy in and of itself is a toy, but a panda bear toy with a little tag on his ear that explains who he is and where he's from and what he eats and what his Latin name is. Now suddenly it's become educational. So that's a place where I would certainly encourage you to get, um, and again, is it is it relatively realistic? You know, is this some, you know, does this look like Porky Pig and he's actually got a little vest on? That's not rural life. I grew up out in the country and I've never seen a little pig with who was vest. had a vest on. So, you know, is the object, is it relatively realistic looking little pig and can you get some educational material with it about, you know, how long it's been farmed in America or just that it's representative at least of a specific breed or something like that. So that's one of those gray areas. It's kind of like my airplane toy example. If, if it's, if it's, a real airplane that could fly, it's probably related. If it's just a toy airplane and it's way too chubby and its wings are too short and it, you know, it looks more like something out of a Pixar cartoon, probably not. So that's what you really want to think about with your plush animals. Is it, is it relatively realistic and can you get some educational material with it? And that's something where the educational material could be very inexpensive. If you could get a quick write-up from some of your um, rural farm animal experts and just get those as hang tags with the animal. Okay. Um, I have two questions that are kind of related, actually. They're sort of asking the same thing. Um, Carol's asking, can you put one tag on the shelf instead of individual tags on every saleable item? And Stephanie's asking, um, in regards to jewelry, does each piece have to have the hang tag with the related information, or is a story card within the case sufficient? So one card, multiple items. The card really needs to go with the item. That's something the IRS looks at, is that if I, if I purchase this item and take it home, and then, you know, give it to Aunt Mabel next Christmas. Is it going to be educational for Aunt Mabel? And if it had a hang tag on the shelf that I failed to pick up or an information card inside the case that I don't have access to once I've left the store, that usually will, will be sufficient to fail the significant related. So, yeah, you really want to either print up a little card that you can include. If, it's, if really one piece of information is sufficient for all jewelry, print it up, make sure it goes in everyone's bag, you know, literally they're, they're just their shopping bag when they leave the store. And if it's something that you've got a tag and you've got it next to the display, um, enclose it in the book, hang tag it on the plush animal's ear. It really needs to go with the item. That's kind of something they look at. That's where they're making it available is not really sufficient. So if you think about that, that's the, I went to the museum and I understood the display and then I bought this item on the way out. The item may not in itself be inherently educational. It needs that educational material with it. Um, the item needs to be able to be um, standalone once I've left. And yep, we know everyone's going to take those hang tags off of the plush animals before we give them to the kid, and we know the jewelry tag is going to get misplaced or thrown in the back of the jewelry box and never seen again, but it really does need to go home with the individual. Okay. Um, our museum is the 1905 Carnegie Library, which is now our city museum. The building is actually part of the collection. If it's pictures on <laughs> items that we sell, do those items relate or not? Do they need some kind of handout information to go along with them to make them so? Um, I'd be curious again to read the mission. It always comes back to the mission, but the fact that the building itself is part of your collection, that right there, um, does it meet the mission? If that's something about the history of the city, well then 1905 library is definitely part of the history of your city. Um, so you've got part of your mission, you've got in your collection. Again, I'm always a little more comfortable with some kind of material going with it. So if it's just a mug with a picture of the front of the museum, that starts to get a little close to that logo wear thing. Like, what's the difference in a picture of the front of the museum and the museum's name? It starts to feel a little logo-y. But if it has the museum, and then this is a 1905 Carnegie Library in, you know, Sweet City, USA, something like that, now we're a lot more connected. Again, this is one of those gray areas. So if you're having these items printed up, I'd say go ahead and print up that little bit of explanatory material the next time you have something produced. It just makes me more comfortable. Right. 
Um, if it makes you more comfortable. It's really not about me. <laughs> it's about your board, your board of directors and, and, and your uh, tax compliance people. But it just really nail that connection home. Okay. Um, a couple of two more questions that are kind of similar also. Um, Susan's asking, if you put a hang tag with the actual museum mission statement on it, <clears throat> will that exempt a t-shirt and plush from UBIT? And Carol was asking, um, can you use a generic education message tag for all your items that are exhibit specific? Um, for the second one, um, I would want to know how, you know, if, if that generic education tag is, you know, really feels connected to each of those items. Again, uh, someone pointed out, you know, the IRS seems to audit item by item. Mm -hmm. So you just have to ask yourself how, how connected that generic thing feels. Is it really you know, this is a, a Japanese item. Part of our, you know, current exhibit is Japanese culture and history. You know, mm, what does that item have to do with Japanese culture and history? Am I really learning anything simply by knowing it's a Japanese item? Maybe so, but think about how does that importantly contribute? You know, we're back to this substantial, important, and um, you're going to need to remind me of that first question. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, if you it was the if you put a hang tag with the museum mission statement, does that exempt a t-shirt or a plush animal? Uh, yeah, that's one. Um, I would I would think probably not because again the uh, the idea is that that item somehow meets the mission. So if my mission is to promote um, understanding about rural farm life, and it actually is my mission to promote understanding about rural farm life, and that's tagged to a cow. Has that really helped me understand anything about rural farm life? I mean, you know, maybe I really did grow up in inner city Manhattan, and I have, I'm not really sure what a cow has to do with rural farm life. So I, I'm not seeing that the mission statement itself really makes the object promote my mission. Okay. Um, uh, Susan's asking, would you reiterate IRS uh, looking to mission statement first and collections second when determining relatedness? She's asking, did she understand that correctly? Um, I think I think the first thing is that, and this is just my opinion. I'm not I'm not trying to uh, second guess the IRS's opinion on this one. I think the first thing is if it doesn't conform to your mission, you you have nothing. So that's that's my first line of defense, I guess. Is if, if this doesn't relate to your mission, then it's unrelated. <laughs> the second thing then is the IRS will start to look, or in my mind, the second thing to look at is how closely related is it to your mission? You know, does it get really tangential? Is it is it barely connected or does it, you know, again, back to substantially, importantly, these kind of nebulous words and everybody's wanting to nail down very, very specific answers and then I'm not giving them specific <laughs> answers. But again, your, your, your first line is always going to be, does it relate to my mission at all? Right. Your second line is going to be, how closely does it relate to my mission? So that was kind of what I was trying to do by putting those two questions in order. Okay. Um, I think last question probably. Uh, what about art supplies in an art museum whose mission is to promote art? Sure, why not? Don't you think that promotes art? I think I, I think we're all artists, right? <laughs> and we well, just I don't the know. Art, we just we just need the art supplies to release it. But I think that's I think that's very related. Did it say to promote interest in art? Uh, it just says whose mission is to promote art. To promote art, I think so. If you're promoting participation with art, that's certainly you know, if you're promoting young artists or old artists or individual artists of any type, I, sh I think certainly so. I would think art supplies would be related. Okay. Likewise, uh, um, just I think if it was a science museum and you sold microscopes, I don't think you need further explanation if the microscope's not going to need a hang tag of any type. We're a science museum. This is a microscope. We're kind of right. done. Right. You know, so same thing with the art museum and the paints. Okay. Um, tons of great information, and a lot of people are commenting that way. Great information, thank you so much, all of that. A um, couple of people asked about, uh, can you show this slide again, etc. cetera. We, we are sending you the presentation, so feel free to um, look at it at your own pace and go back and forth as much as you need to and take a look. It'll probably be uh, later this afternoon or um, tomorrow morning when that link will go out. Um, and remember to take the survey on your way out. That really helps us quite a bit here um, at MSA in determining future educational programming. Angeline, thank you so much 
Um, lots oh, of great information. Thank I you really, so much. I Tom. really hope it's helped people. Yeah, definitely. So thanks everybody for attending and um, have enjoy the rest of your day. Go get some lunch. All right, and thank you all. And as I said, do do feel free to contact me. I I really love I really love museums. <laughs> <laughs> and it shows. We can tell. So lot, everybody's making comments. Thank you, Clarity. Thank you. Very helpful. Great. So um, so thank you. All right, you're so very welcome. I do hope to hear from some of you. And thank you, Stephanie, for the opportunity. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Angeline. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.